Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Florence Sumere. I'm the VP of Marketing Communications for Ethics and Compliance Initiative. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar and thank you to Vault Platform for sponsoring ECI's leading edge webinar, The Trust Gap, Expect Expectation versus Reality in the Workplace Misconduct and Speak Up Culture. Without further ado, let me introduce Tori Reitman. She's the Chief Customer Officer with Vault Platform and Keith Wathane, Senior Legal Director for the International Group and Ethics and Compliance Director with TI Fluid Systems. Tori and Kevin, please tell us a little bit about yourself before diving in um, today. Thanks so much. Well, hi everyone. I'm Tori Reichman, Chief Customer Officer at Vault Platform. Um, just a little bit about me, as the team backstage just noticed, I am American, but I am living in London. I've been here for just over 12 years. Um, I am part of the founding team at Vault Platform. So really help build our business, growing it, scaling it, um, and getting to work with some amazing brands and organizations such as TIFS. Um, and I'm so pleased to have Kevin join us this evening. Um, if you'd like to know more about me in detail, such as how I got to London or why I um, am passionate about building Vault Platform, please feel free to connect with me directly after the event um, on LinkedIn. Would love to have a separate conversation. But now um, I would love to have Kevin introduce himself. Joy, thank you so much. And ECI, thanks for having me on your platform uh, for this today. So my name is Kevin Wadane. I'm the Group Ethics and Compliance Director at TI Fluid Systems, which is a uh, FTSE 250 um, company listed in London. Um, I'm based in Sudbury, um, but I was actually based in the US for a few years and then decided to return a year ago, pretty much to the day. I didn't realize that. Wow. Yeah, Motown. How does it feel to be back? Oh, uh, it's lovely. I mean, obviously spent most of the last year in this exact room because we've been locked down here, but um, it's been, it's so nice to be home. Uh, I know there's no, there's no place like it. Well, we're very glad that you came back to London and we're very glad to, to be partnering with you and getting to know you and the rest of the TI, TIFS group. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, dig right into today's conversation. Um, so for those of you who don't know, hopefully you do know why you joined, but if you don't, um, you've come to hear Kevin and I have a bit of a fireside chat around Vault Platform's newly released report called The Trust Gap. Um, the Trust Gap was is a piece of independent research that we commissioned um, and our whole intention was to be able to get a view on what employees are feeling in the workplace and employers' perspectives on that. And so Kevin and I are going to be able to talk a little bit about what, what we've seen come out of the report and get a real life employer's perspective from, um, from his ear to the ground at what's happening at TIFS and the, the many organizations that he has relationships with. So a little bit about the trust gap. Um, what we did was Vault Platform partnered with Europe's largest polling company, Norstat. We surveyed 2,000 office workers spread across the UK and the US. Um, the focus was to gather insights on these workers' experiences of misconduct and the expectations that they have of their employers to keep them safe and whether they actually truly trust the employers to do so. Then, to conduct the second piece of research, we took this data, we took these findings, and we separately polled about 500 decision makers spread across the ethics and compliance communities to be able to understand their views on what the employees were saying to us. So using this data, alongside the publicly available government data and actually lots of some really interesting industry data, we've been able to formulate a few hypotheses, a couple of predictions of on the broader impact of the economy. 
um, which we're going to share with you today. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I believe there is a section to post your questions, so please feel free to do so throughout. Um, I will be moderating and so pulling in questions throughout the conversation when it feels relevant. Otherwise, don't worry, I will save them to the end and try and get through as many of them as we can. Um, and then we also have two polling questions for you today. So please do participate in them. Um, so without further ado, I'm actually gonna kick off with our first polling question. So are you ready? Okay. What do you in the audience think the percentage is for office workers who have either experienced or witnessed misconduct in their working lives. So we spoke to 2,000 employees across the US and the UK, and we asked them their experiences of how many of them um, experienced or witnessed misconduct in their working lives. And now we're asking you what you think the results are. So we'll give a couple minutes to come in. Kevin, without revealing the answer, um, what, what was your take when you heard the answer to this question? Uh, I was actually surprised and I say surprised, but had a gut feeling that it probably would be like this. Mm. Um, I think you reveal, I think you might have actually revealed it to us um, at the time. And I remember think, sitting there thinking there's a, um, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of work and it's really sad, actually. It's just really sad. Uh, it's kind of that gut feeling where it's like, I don't really want this to be the case, but I'm afraid yeah. it might be. But then, uh, you know, jokingly, uh, it keeps me in the job for a few, what, a few years at least. But no, seriously, I think as ethics and compliance professionals, it's a real opportunity using data like this to then help inform us, but also it's not, we, we've, we sort of, we're already with that mindset of we have to do things to, to address that misconduct in the workplace, but it's to help educate the people uh, in the executive suites at the board level to help them partner with us. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think we have the poll results in. And so now that Kevin and I are talking about it, I'm actually gonna share, um, I'm gonna share what the results are. Um, I think you guys did a really good job, unfortunately. So 59% of our respondents said 75% of people, working people experienced or witnessed misconduct across their working lives. Um, you're absolutely correct. It is a very, very high percentage. So Kevin, I think, you know, hearing that 75% of office workers have experienced or witnessed some form of misconduct um, in their working lives. I'm actually gonna give you another piece of data that we learned from the research, which was that of the 75% who experienced it, only 37% actually reported these incidents. Um, why do you think that is? Well, uh, that is shockingly low deeply troubling uh culture yeah. it's got to be culture yeah. uh, there's a culture where you know in some organizations i i know that um i've had this question just when you when you go to conferences you're talking to people and i remember having this conversation with someone and they said why do we want to know this mm. uh why do we want people to report like yeah if it, if it's that important they will if it's if it's like workplace, you know, it's a, it's management issues or it's the man, they just don't like their manager. It's like, well, because it goes to productivity and it goes to your heart of your culture. And don't you want to, your culture is something that you sell to the outside world. It's also something that is a, like an living organism yeah. and done really well. It gives you strength and energy and productivity and innovation done really badly. It's like a cancer that will slowly, slowly eat away. So you can still be functioning until the core inside is rotten. And I think that's yeah. a worry um, mm -hmm. this, but also I think it's an immediate call to action, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, you know, the, I think there's something in it that so few people feel safe to speak up. I wonder if there's a piece where employees don't feel empowered 
to be able to have a voice, perhaps. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, it's how they're treated, right? Uh, from a, from a, as a human, are they dehumanized to an extent? Are they a commodity? I mean, every annual report will tell you that the greatest asset of any organization is its people. Yeah. Uh, but clearly, looking at this report, Tori, uh, that's not the case because people are not, they don't feel safe enough to speak up. Maybe they don't even, it's maybe it's not that they don't even feel safe enough. Maybe they don't even have the right tools. Like, you know, I think back to TI a few years ago, like, say, six, seven years ago. Yeah. To have a, our hotline was an email address that went to, and the emails went to three people. It's essentially one email address that went to three people. Okay. But the amount of people that reported that had to make an effort to change, like, you know, not to be spotted, to make it anonymous. So they're obviously coming up. It's not from a work, they were never from work email addresses. They were yeah. always from these Gmail addresses or addresses that you just, you know, you couldn't identify who the person was. Um, and it was like, wow, those people went to so much effort, probably in their own time, to, mm. to support something, which really, if they had the proper tools, it would have been made easier, or, they, or if they had the, um, the empowerment to actually go and speak to somebody, actually just go into their boss's office or the HR's office or the regional director's office or somebody else. But obviously it wasn't the case. So then, you know, we had to look at tool, creating tools, which is, other avenues to to be able to report and educating that reporting is good it's one it we want you to do it um, yeah but it you have to have everybody saying that well i think that goes to what you said at the start of this around creating the right culture and, and talking about creating culture and having leadership have the right view of that they actually do want to encourage people to speak up and to raise those reporting rates, right? I think in other conversations you and I have had, you've talked about how you organizations can only tackle what they know about. And so there's so much value in increasing the rates of reporting and encouraging people, giving them the tools so that they can talk to you directly so that you can tackle whatever whatever those misconduct experiences are so that they, they can start to direct the culture in the right way. Forgive me if I'm paraphrasing, but you know, I I know that's a big piece of your of your Yeah, view. I think it's you know, there was a time when compliance was really a checked box exercise. Mm. I don't think it exists in the world like that anymore. I think those days are gone. You know, you sort of go back for a timeline, go back into sort of the early two thousands and you had you know, uh, the Enrons and then the sarbanes Oxley came in. So there was all this paper and like, let's just have this sort of tick the box. And it was very regimented. Then we had the global financial crisis. Um, and then we still kept having issues, like issue after issue after issue. And they're big headline issues. And it's not like these organizations didn't have compliance or ethics organizations. It's just that they wasn't oper operationalized because they weren't in the culture. And it's, you no, know, we can keep. We can look at so many different companies and go, culture. Like the people didn't speak up. Those people are probably the same ones in this report. You know. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, I agree. I'm. I'm gonna take another um, angle here, and in thinking about misconduct that we experience, or the, the misconduct that was reported through the study, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand what the impacts of the misconduct in the workplace might be having on organizations at large and actually more broadly on the economy. So I might just give a little bit of data that we learned from the study and then ask you to comment on that as well. So we we know from the research that the toll of misconduct takes is massive on people, it's massive on the business. And like I said before, it actually has a huge impact on the economy. So some stats from the report that we learned of the people who experience misconduct, 66% of them said that they experienced a negative impact on their productivity. It's probably not a surprise, um, but I wonder if these numbers might be a bit more shocking, which is 45% of them ended up leaving their roles and 49% of them ended up taking time away from their roles. So basically, of all the people who experienced misconduct, 
half of them left and half of them took time off. So basically everyone who experienced misconduct took time away from work. And again, not surprising, the majority of them, two thirds of them reported having a negative, um, experiencing a negative impact on their personal well-being. So I might just pause at that and, and kind of ask you for some comments on, on the implications of people leaving their roles, taking time away from their roles. Um, I think, you know, look, putting this in all into context now, we're, we're, well, I think we're still in a pandemic. Some people would disagree. Um, but essentially for the last, last 18 months, uh, most, well, a great many people have been able to work remotely, whether that's from yeah. home or in alternative locations rather than office. So, uh, in some senses, it's unsurprising uh, there's been a negative impact, which has affected productivity, which you, know, you can put it another way. It's like, well, what if we could just increase that by 1% by just allowing a little bit more speak up? You know, what does that mean on the financial perspective? Because productivity is always measured at the end of the bottom line, right? Yeah. Uh, it is. We have to monetize everything. So uh, what could we do? But now you've got this opportunity to like, hold on, I don't need to work for this company anymore. I've just, I'm just done. And it's, you know, that environment is not the right one for me. And I've proved I can work from home. So hold on, there's a whole load of companies now giving me the opportunity to still remain at home in a work-based situation. I, and they want me for not what I do in the office, but actually just to bring myself to work. And they're, they're offering a culture that, uh at least from outside sounds pretty good i'm going to go there so i think you know there's that negative impact of if you don't do something to address what your people are saying right now and they're telling you you're going to lose talent and you know you're going to see companies go out of business it won't be now it'd be in a few years time because that's when we will see the true effect of what this like what they call it the great resignation um mm -hmm. and i think Oh, that great resignation is due in part to the acts that were done previously and how companies disempowered employees to an extent. Yeah, it's um we we did some desk research on this actually, talking about the financial costs. And so we um we learned that from a recent Glassdoor study um of US companies, the study found that the average employer spends approximately four thousand dollars in 24 days to hire a new worker. Um, so perhaps that sounds familiar to, to the folks on the call. Um, we extrapolated that. And so that means that these U.S. office-based businesses spent approximately $20 million on hiring costs in the last 12 months. I mean, that's a, from my view, that's a staggering cost where actually if you were investing in your employees in the right way and encouraging them to speak up about the experiences that they're having, the negative experiences that they're having, misconduct that they're experiencing, you actually are able to save yourselves the these um, replacement costs because you're not getting the attrition, right? You're getting people, they're staying, you're able to keep them, they stay happy, they're building and contributing to a culture that you want them to be able to build and contribute to. And you're able to invest that money in actually what the business objective is, not recruitment, unless you're a recruitment company, in which case, yay. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's really, I think it's really significant there. You know, thinking about that, uh, I was just thinking, can I just take that number and say to my boss, look, give me, give me 10% of this. And do you know what, I'm going to grow your entire culture from that. Because, you know, like, like you, well, I mean, Toy, uh, Vault has, you, you know, you're a founder, so you know about bootstrapping. Well, that's what ethics and compliance professionals do every single day. We have to bootstrap because we're the ones that tend to have to fight for cash. So uh, it's also frustrating to see something like that because mm -hmm. I fight for cash and then I realize, well, hold on, these simple things that I would like to see done are actually costing us that money, which if I had just a fraction of that, I could do a huge amount for every single employee. Absolutely. Absolutely. So actually on that point and like stuff that you think you could do. So as part of the survey, 41% of the organizations that we spoke to 
so these aren't the employees now. These are the decision makers that we spoke to. So 41% of them admitted that their organization is not competent in capturing and measuring workplace misconduct. And so why do you think that is? <laughs> uh, I think there are a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, so there are organizations or there are even segments within organizations that just don't believe in capturing data. They think it's just an additional administrative burden okay. without, without having justification. I know this because I've had those conversations. Um, uh, there's a lack of tools or quality tools um, that actually give really useful insights in a, you know, for, for when we're saying the decision makers, we're talking about essentially the executive team and probably one or two levels below yeah. uh, in an organization. They need the information presented in a very easy to understand and they can grasp the key issues straight away. Mm -hmm. And so visual tools are really, really useful. And there aren't many. Mm -hmm. And it's just time consuming to, con to try and manufacture that internally. Um, and there's, it isn't, there aren't that many great ones on the market. Uh, I think um, we relied on hotlines, like legacy hotlines, mm -hmm. um, which I think is great. But if you look at the demographics of the workplace, I think it's changing to an extent. Mm -hmm. So people my age and a little bit older, we are starting to move towards the end of our uh, shelf life. But this is amazing two generations currently was a generation coming in is a great generation currently sitting in there also taking leadership roles right now and i think um they want something different because they operate different their daily lives they use like this or a tablet or something else so having tools that work for them and it's funny because i can send emails to my work colleagues i do not get response I send them like a WhatsApp and boom. <laughs> it's like, I don't get it. Like, I sent you an email. <laughs> uh, it's true. It's so true. <laughs> you've got both on your phone, but you use the WhatsApp. I don't, I don't understand. So um, I think having the right tools for leaders or for, for those who need to see this data is important. But also, how do you um, then use that data? Mm. Worst thing to do is just sit on it. Yeah. Um, and even reports like this, if you if your employees knew that you did something like this internally mm -hmm. and then you did nothing for another two years, but you mm -hmm. do it in another two years because you have to because you've got a report under your you know listing rules or whatever. Uh, it has to be part of your annual report. Your employees are just never going to give you genuine answers. They're never – you, and they're just never going to trust you. And I think that's what it comes down to is the lack of trust between – employers and employees and, and it goes both ways right as well that that trust thing um or that trust piece um they want to people want to see you employees also want to see you um investigating like we're giving you information we're telling you something's happened mm -hmm. and we've got to change now using that example that i gave you of having to create a fake email address to send a email to your work colleagues ultimately your work colleagues uh and then you don't find out anything happens. There's no way, easy way to communicate back and forth. Mm -hmm. It just erodes. It's just a further erosion of trust in that there's organizational justice. Like, what's the point in reporting? Which then goes back to, yeah, I've seen a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to report it. Because what's the point? I think um, <clears throat> that point around closing the loop and giving employees visibility, <clears throat> sorry, giving employees the visibility that, an investigation is taking place. That, in my experience, was a huge way to establishing or strengthening your own credibility and building trust with people because they may they may not love the outcome, right? Like the the outcome of their situation may be unsubstantiated, fine. But the fact that you've carried through a comprehensive investigation, the fact that they've had visibility to how you're progressing that the investigation is actually progressing and then you're getting a direct communication back to them that says we've concluded our investigation and we've closed this all with 
having the ability to do it in a streamlined way in a shorter period of time than previously, I think gives leadership teams, gives management teams the information they need to be able to support the business in the way that they need to, right? It helps them direct their intervention efforts. And by continuously closing the loop on stuff that does come in, you reinforce to employees actually that if you tell us what's happening, we're going to look into it and we're going to we're going to come back to you and say, yep, we agree. You know, we believe that there is something here. We need to do something about it. Or actually, no, this is right. Like, give us the opportunity to clarify for you our stance on these kinds of things. But without having access to the information, the, the employee's concerns, you can't have those conversations. It's just not coming. Yeah, like, I'll put that into the context of, like, sort of a workplace. So my company is in manufacturing, manufacturing automotive uh, parts. We sell to all the big uh, OEMs around the world. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, the OEMs have monitoring systems for parts being returned at dealers. Like if there's a problem with your brake line or your fuel line. And so we can see, because we can log into the OEM's data to see if there's issues. So we might be going, hold on, look, there's a lot of these happening. There might be a quality issue. And I tell you, as a management tool, we really need that. It's really, really useful because we can jump on it because is it a process issue? Is there something in the manufacturing process that we need to alter? Because the parts that we supply, to an extent, are safety critical. So Mm -hmm. let's change something based on that data, based on what essentially the end user is telling us because they're having to take their car into a dealer because of a problem. And then it's going to the dealer who goes to the customer who then will go to us. Recall. That's a really, really expensive exercise. Uh, we never want that. They don't want that. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. Uh, but what would you, you know, there could be a lot more recalls out there, not just like, you know, just so many different products, but it's because there aren't because we use this data. So like if we can see things happening, oh, right, there may have been a problem. We don't need to do mm. a recall. No people taking their cars in or it's coming up to service time. Let's just change it out. Let's just change out a part. It's free. The end user doesn't uh, is not affected, doesn't know, but it's done and it's completely yeah. fine. It stops the recall. But you can only do that because of the real data that you get and utilizing that data. And that's going to your point of uh, managers need to, can use this data to make the tweaks that they need. And when we go back to talking about culture, mm-hmm. culture that cha- ebbs and flows. In my view, culture is made up of people, and it's made up of the yeah. norm, and, and it's people that make the norms ultimately. Uh, you know, isn't policies and procedures. They set a framework, but then people operate within those and around those. And it's, but it's people. So when you get new people in and out, invariably the micro cultures within separate parts of the organization can ebb and flow. And data, having a consistency of being able to look at data around this, like how people are feeling, are they seeing misconduct? What types of misconduct? I mean, we're not talking, it doesn't have to be like, the biggest fraud ever it could be it's a regular course of bullying and you know that could be an opportunity it may be that you know you've promoted somebody they're relatively new manager their style was quite bullish it is a style issue which can be worked on i think that's an opportunity to develop somebody and actually they might mm-hmm. be brilliant in numbers and everything else but it's like yes use this data and go look you might need to work on some of your people skills here uh there's a great mm-hmm. course lots of mentoring or coaching you can do I think that's a great win for the company as well it's like you invest in your people it's not about like right well you've been bullying so you're out it's like there might be some remediation work that you can do here I think yep. that's an opportunity uh, it's a fantastic opportunity and without without letting employees know that that experience is valid and valued you really will struggle to be able to build that trust um, with with your employees. I think it's that constant reinforcement of being able to say, yeah, we we are doing something about this, right? And and in your example, to be able to see that the manager's style does change over time with a little bit of help, but it's only because the employees have the courage to speak up about it um, yeah. that you that you facilitate that. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question from the research? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you carried out the research uh, and you were able to understand the concerns from 
What were the differences between, I guess, uh, the employee and employer perspective when reporting conduct? That, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so the employees said that, so more than a third of the employees that we spoke to said kind of the following three things. Um, a massive concern for them was, would the report be treated anonymously? Um, and more than a third said their concern was that the report, that making a report would impact their reputation in the company. Um, and almost a third said that they were concerned that the person reviewing their report wouldn't take them seriously. Um, and so employees, like they really, they really showed that they don't trust their organization to look after them. Um, if they were to be able to come forward. And I think what we heard from that is the trust and this empowerment, employees just don't feel like they have it. And so on the flip side of that, um, employers said, so half the employers that we spoke to said that they believe that there's a lack of reporting from those who experience and from those who experience and witness it. So we we hear from employees that actually they don't feel like their report is going to be treated fairly or that their anonymity isn't going to be truly protected. 50, almost 50% of the folks that we, the decision makers that we spoke to said that they believe that there is a lack of reporting. So it's actually not um, a difference in perspective. It's actually quite a similar perspective yeah. between employee employer um, and actually the employers, again, almost 50% of them said that a lack of trust that the reports would be investigated fairly is why they believe employees aren't reporting enough. Um, so again, there's actually more employers percentage wise believe that employees believe that the report wouldn't be treated fairly. So employers actually have this um, probably right perception that People don't feel like their report is going to be taken seriously. And then employers feel like the reason that people don't speak up is because there's a lack of reporting, like quality technology available. So about 40% of the decision makers that we spoke with think that the reason people don't speak up is because they don't have access to the right tools. Um, so it's interesting to see that the top three concerns for the employee and the employer were actually not like for like, there's a little bit of overlap between confidence and trust around the report being taken seriously, but actually the other dimensions um, that were at the top three for each of those groups were quite different. Um, and I find that, I personally find that unfortunately not surprising, but I, I do find it a bit um, discouraging that there's such a gap between how employees see their workplace and how employees think they would be able to speak up or what they want to be able to do versus employers who are essentially are agreeing and saying, you don't have this. Um, we get that you don't feel like you can trust when you report to us. What do you think about that? Which is, oh, I want to scream because it's like, you know what they need. They need, you need to show them that these things are investigated by actually investigating them. And you don't have to get, you know, as we all know in ethics and compliance, you don't need to like tell the reporter the gory details of any investigation. They just need to know that it's been investigated. And mm -hmm. I actually believe in greater transparency is talking to the organization as a whole about issues that come up without naming people and making sure that confidentiality and some of the actions are are, are kept sacred and you stick to those, like they, they don't have to be disclosed. But showing an organization that we do get reports in and we do act on it. And this is how these are some of the examples of things that have come up. And these are some of the examples of how we address them. I think yeah. only build trust. But to sit there as a manager and know that 50 percent of your like 50 percent of those managers think it's a trust issue. That's a huge number. Half your leadership population in an organization think our oh, people don't trust us. And then what? Like just sit there. 
uh, I think it's a call to action. It's another call to action to do something. And to be honest, they're not asking you to do a lot. They're asking you just look at their claim. Um, well, you know, if you were if you were a leadership leader uh, and you wanted to make a claim on your travel insurance and you put your claim in because you went on a business trip and you lost your sunglasses or your favorite Armani suit, you put your claim in and it just sits there and the insurance company didn't do anything, but you paid your premiums, but they didn't do anything, like you're gonna get really annoyed and they're just gonna stop using them and you're gonna leave that insurance and it's exactly the same sort of thing that, you know that these there's a lack of trust, you have to be, it's, it's on the actually organization to build the trust, at least to, to, to make the first knowledge branch and it's, you know, it goes down to psychological safety because that's what you're trying to build. And I think as ethics and compliance professionals, there's a lot of work that we're doing now is like teams need to, people need to feel psychologically safe, but there has to be an element of trust in there as well to, to get that, to get to that level. And it's a, you know, it's about giving them the right tools, but also just doing the soft stuff, like talking to people like, yes, we understand there's concerns and being a bit more transparent with it. I think something you said when we were when we were catching up yesterday, which I wonder if the audience might find interesting, is you your phrase was that people seem disillusioned, um, and I I wonder would you elaborate on that? Would you would you tell the audience here kind of why how this all makes you feel like the the business might be a bit disillusioned? Yeah, I think um, you know disillusionment goes both ways, right? It's uh, particularly after the last. 18 months you know you haven't seen anybody but when you have they look different like to be fair before we were out of the office I'd walk the halls mm -hmm. and I'd talk to people because I, I just I like asking people random questions uh, like why are you here uh, literally why do you turn up why, why this company as opposed to anywhere else in the world like so I'm interested to know but I do that because to get a sense of what are people feeling yeah uh, and so my perception is different maybe to some of my colleagues who, if they don't go, and, if you don't go and talk to people, you don't listen. And it is really about listening. Uh, and I'll go on to that in a second. Um, if you don't listen to them, like, you're not going to know. So then you just form your perception of, well, how, how, how are we doing as a business? Look, we're financially, we're performing relatively well, or we're underperforming, or there's this area where we need improvement. So you're focusing on like metrics and not people. Yeah. And, I think that's a big part of the issue of why people want to feel valued. Like even on a basic human level, you want to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of value, but also a sense of being able to contribute. And sometimes being able to contribute is saying, I think something's wrong here. I'm not 100% sure, but this doesn't seem right to me. And then you want, you just want something to, you want something to go acknowledged. We really acknowledge you, but actually having looked at it, there isn't an issue here. And this is why or thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. It was really important. Uh, and we, we have looked at it and, we'll, and we'll, we'll be taking actions as necessary. But also from the business side, you're looking at the employees and it just sounds like, oh, they're just beating up employers because we're, we're open, see it's open season on employers. You know, there's that, magic, you know, and, and particularly now where we haven't seen people, but people are going back to the office. Not everybody necessarily wants to be there. And so, there's that, you know, oh, it's just, it's just employees. They're upset because they have to come back to the office. But at the end of the day, like we have this lovely office, we provide them good quality services in the offices. They need to be here. The job is an office based job. That was just an anomaly for 18 months. And so yeah. I think there's this disconnect between, it's like a dysfunctional relationship actually. Uh, <laughs> when you're not talking to each other. And you don't want to listen yeah. and going, going back to the point of listening is exactly what my wife has told me is sometimes like you're talking and it looks like you're listening, but you're not, you're hearing and you just mm. pick up like one little thing. So we, and the employee is like, no, I'm really actually saying this or the employer is saying, really, this is the entire statement of what I said, but you've picked up that tiny little bit there because that's the bit you can hang your sort of argument on. Um, and I think that's a big problem. Um, that has yeah. to change, but this is an opportunity, not a not a criticism. It's an opportunity. I think so. And actually, before I um, so we have another polling question, but before I go to the question, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kind of 
drop a statistic in there from the research that I probably should have mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about um, that 75% of office workers have experienced misconduct at least some point in their life. The, the complement to that that I didn't go with, but I'm going to add now, is that in the U.S., I want to make sure I get the stat right, so I'm just going to pull it up now. So in the U.S., almost half of the workers that we spoke to, um, so 48%, in the US and then 37% of the UK office workers that we spoke to um, in both work in both sides of the pond said that they experienced misconduct at least once a month. So I think this conversation that we're just having around really hearing people and really listening to them, I think becomes increasingly more important when you when you add that data into the conversation, when you realize that half of the people, you know, we spoke to 2000 people, half in the US, half in the UK, half of the people in the US that we spoke to said that they're experiencing misconduct at least once a month. That's, that's staggering. And if only 37% of people are reporting what they experience, I mean, there's really, there's really a lot of risk to businesses that they just, they just don't know about it. Um, so the question that I have with all of that context then to, to the folks here today is, what do you think the percentages um, of office workers that agree they would be more likely to report misconduct if they didn't have to talk to someone? Like if they didn't have to, if, if they didn't have to exclusively talk to a human, what do you think the percentage is of office workers who would be more likely to report misconduct? So your choices are 40%, 50%, 60%, or 70%. And while people are focusing on that, um, Kevin, do you want to comment on my staggering statistic of the rates of misconduct? <laughs> yeah, I'll to you. I think, you know, when, when we were talking about your report before, I said, uh, you should just send out the raw data and there's a TV <laughs> show in the UK and get people to like literally film themselves reading the report, like the raw <laughs> data rather than the report, just because that... Yeah. You know, question gave it away it's like oh my word this is just uh that is staggering actually um i've got it's to crazy. admit i wasn't expecting it to be that high and i like i think about like when i was last working in an office which was 18 months ago um but whilst i saw people probably feeling disillusioned or you know uh, a bit beaten down um i didn't you know as an ethics director i'm not thinking to myself oh we have a issue of like 50 percent of these people are seeing something wrong and, mm -hmm. and maybe like it isn't that high in my organization but you know we're we're a global organization so you, you always can get pockets that are really good and pockets that are really bad and somewhere in between but taking this 50 percent as an average of of mm -hmm. the ones that you polled that is that's a lot but also it it's a real risk for businesses because you're you're only moments away from the next uh hashtag me too or whatever the new hashtag's gonna be, right? Um you're like literally seconds away from that. Someone has that's like, I'm I'm done, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And it's like captured on camera, posted on social media, and then you're just you you're just out there. And you know, the reputational risk, um, which is, I think, is a, a very, very important factor these days. And I think ethics and compliance, compliance professionals should be really thinking about um, reputational risks a lot more now, just because of how easy things are to um, to, to get in, to get out. Um, and it's not even to the traditional press, right, that you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about the New, New York Times, like, doing an expose, like you just need to be on Twitter trending in the US as the number one thing. And it's like, that's your reputation in the tatters. Yeah. Um, yep. I, I, yeah, they've got to look at it. They've got to look at it. <laughs> Do something. So, I'll give the report, I'll give the um, results of the poll, but then I'm going to come back and ask you a question about um, your decision and NTI Fluid Systems decision. So the, the, um, response to the poll, again, you guys are doing great. Um, you were right. So about 50, just over 50% of the participants said um, they think the response was 
70%, so 70% of office workers agree that they would be more likely to report misconduct if they didn't have to talk to someone. That's correct. Um, that's what we found. And so with that context, Kevin, I know that TI Fluid Systems has made the decision to move away from a legacy telephone hotline solution um, to a digital solution. I'd love just kind of a, a quick snippet of um, your your and the leadership team's decision making around this. Um, and after you answer that, I'm going to open up questions to the audience. So this is these are your final words before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I think for us, uh, you know, we got to state just a few years ago, we were just email. It was just this email ethics at, you know, whatever it was then. Um, and then, you know, I remember looking at it going, got to do better than this. Like we have to give give them a tool at least, and we've got to show some investment. So we 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 did take a hotline. The ultimate truth is that there wasn't a huge take up, and now some of it could be down to lack of marketing and so forth. But to be fair, like it was promoted globally, it was promoted everywhere, and there's regularly you know there's lots of signs and posters. People still didn't want to speak to people, you know, and and we still got emails. We'll get these random emails, like even when we had the hotline rolled out. And yeah. I know that in the same plant are obviously using the hotline because when those when we did get those hotline claims, it said this plant uh, seen on poster. So you, it's very visible. But yeah, okay. other people in the same location would didn't they just didn't want to speak to someone. So we decided let's look at this and go, what can we do? Also, like thinking about demographics, right, as well, as I mentioned earlier, there is a change in demographics in the workplace and it's understanding what do workers want today. So I guess it was for us, it's like, well, how can we future proof part of this? Because we can't, you know, you can't keep changing your hotline. Um, or, and what's the way? And, you know, to be fair, using things like Teams, you know, you see how 